we're back again looking at Anansaib. Anansaib is all about how do you find bliss in your life. And today in verse 10, we're going to be looking at how the mind can sometimes play tricks on us. The 10th verse of Anansaib begins, O fickle mind, none have obtained this through mind games. Through mind games, none have obtained. Listen, mind of mine. This enchanting Maya has fooled you with this delusion. Maya was made enchanting by that one who gave the drug. I sacrificed myself to that who made attachment so sweet. Says Nanak, fickle mind, none have obtained through mind games. In the last verse, we talked about this idea of tan, man, dan, sabsamp, gurko. Body, mind and wealth surrender all to the Guru and hukuma maniyapaya, accept the will. And when you accept the will, you find it. And a natural question that occurs is, why do I have to give up anything at all? Can't I have it all? Can't I have my worldly life and my worldly attachments and have spiritual knowledge and spiritual experience? Can't I live in a balance of, of these two perfectly in harmony? And to this, the Guru gives the reply that, O oh, fickle mind, nobody has obtained spirituality like this. Nobody has managed to find it through mind tricks, through games, through clever little tricks that the mind does to fool you. And what Guru tries to do here is Guru now starts to explain to us what some of the barriers have been. We've spent so many verses talking about what bliss is like and make your life into a song and, and how you need to surrender all these things. But now Guru's get, going into more clarity as to what the biggest barrier is in your life and what the characteristics of the mind are that stop us from achieving this. The first word that Guru has used for the mind is chanchal. Chanchal is the idea that the mind is always distracted, it's ever-changing, it's scattered, it's always looking around. The mind is always looking elsewhere and it very rarely looks within itself. It's, it's convinced that bliss is always somewhere out there and it's never understood that true bliss is within yourself itself. So when it's always looking at the outside world, the mind thinks that this is where real happiness lies. And when we think about it in that way, it's so true in our life. It's so true that this is how we spend our whole life just chasing bliss. And we just listen to whatever thought comes in the mind, whatever idea pops into our head, we think this must be true. We absolutely need to do whatever this mind has said. So when we've become so comfortable with the habit of always looking outwards for happiness, always looking for bliss as being something outside of us, then when we go on a spiritual journey, we make spirituality as another external bliss as well. We think about spirituality as a way of gaining pleasure, as a way of doing certain practices. We have new ideas, new concepts like oneness and non-duality. Um, we join new communities. We get, a, we get friendship with other people who are doing these things. We might even change our lifestyle. We might dress a certain way or change our diet. And when we do all these things, we're, we're then convinced that this is now a spiritual lifestyle that we're leading. And the Guru is saying, this is a trick. This is a trap that your mind is playing on you. And the next word that Guru has used is Chaturai. This trick, the mind is fooling you into thinking that spiritual progress can happen by making changes to your external lifestyle. And the Guru has always very strongly stressed the idea that you need to make a change to your mind and your mindset, to your way of thinking, and not just to your external practices. So, as well as maybe changing your diet or or your clothes, or the things that you read, the Guru asks an important question, have you given up your attachments to the world? Have you given up the love that you have for your own body? Have you given up the attachment that you have towards your family, 
towards your friends, towards the ideas of what you are and what your life should be about? Have you changed that? Because if you haven't, then your mind is playing a trick on you. And Guru clarifies this concept even further in this verse. He says, e maya mohni jin et parampalaya. This enchanting maya has fooled you with this delusion. And so a new idea is being introduced here, which is the concept of maya. And this is such a deep subject that it really needs to be understood so that we can realize the impact that maya is having on our life. So the way to think about maya is the ultimate deception, the delusion of matter itself, the delusion that the physical world is the only and ultimate reality. And this is the delusion that we are always in. It's as though our minds have been in a fog and we're not able to see very clearly. And in the ancient spiritual traditions of India, we've seen a very important analogy to try and describe what this looks like. And the analogy is that imagine you walk into a dark room and you see a snake in the corner and you jump and you're very scared and you're frightened. But as soon as you switch the light on, you realize that it's never been a snake. It wasn't a snake at all. In fact, it was just a rope that was coiled up. And this analogy of seeing a snake when really it was a rope is something that the spiritual masters have used to try and show you that just as when you're in a dark room and you see a rope, but your mind projects the idea that there's a snake there. In the same way, our mind projects the idea of ourselves. Your mind sees one thing and assumes it's something else. And you think that you are an individual. Rather than looking at what you really are, the mind projects the illusion of me onto the body. Me being the snake, the individual, as the owner of this body. The mind projects this idea that I am a real thing. So let's understand that a little bit more. Rather than acknowledging that there is a body here, there are thoughts here, there are possessions here, the mind in its ignorance doesn't know and doesn't reflect on whose body is this? Whose mind is this? Whose environment is this? The mind in its ignorance without knowing comes up with the conclusion that there is a voice in this head. So the voice in the head must be the owner of this body. There is a voice in this mind. And so everything that it says, it must be the creator of those thoughts. Every thought that comes into the mind, the voice inside my head must be the creator of those thoughts. The spiritual masters are simply those who have gone in and introspected. And it's very important that we understand that when we talk about spiritual leaders, masters, meditators, mindfulness experts, we're not talking about some people who are believing in something mystical. They don't just put their faith in some imaginary ideas of oneness. In the old days, spirituality and science was essentially the same thing. The spiritual masters were the scientists, but what they did more than anything else is rather than just observing the external world without interfering with it, which is the way of science at the moment, what they did is they also observed themselves. They went in and applied the same scientific method of observing things and rationally recording them down and checking with their peers to make sure that what I'm observing is also what you can observe when you go within yourself. They used a very scientific method, but not to observe the world, but to observe themselves. And when they went within themselves, the big question that they asked themselves is, okay, I think there is a me. Let me go find that me. Where is that me? And the deeper they looked within themselves, they realized there is no me. The me cannot be found. It is a delusion. It is something that appears 
from the mind. The mind projects the idea of me. But when we look within ourselves, there is nothing tangible that we can find. There is no creator of thoughts. There is no thinker within myself. There is no me. And so this is such an important idea. And when they came out of that, they realized we've all been deluded. Every single human being believes that there is a me within themselves. It's like they've been drugged. And so the mind is this snake. The mind is the illusion of the snake when really all there is is a rope itself. So this is what we do with our life. We forget that there is just a body, there is just life, the body is made of elements of nature and we create this idea that it belongs to me. And really we need to understand that life doesn't belong to you, the body doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the totality, to the oneness itself. But as long as you think that there is a snake, there is going to be the fear of the snake. As long as you think that there is a me, there is going to be all the worries of the me, the problems of the me are, are all going to be there. As long as you believe the idea, there is a me, I cannot deny it, I looked within myself and there's definitely a me. Let's look at this idea of a me itself. What is the me? When there is a body and there is a voice within the head and there are thoughts, one of the thoughts that the mind creates is I am here. What it means by that is within us there is physical body, there is thoughts and there is also a third thing which is our awareness and, and, and I realize I might be going a little bit further than some of you are comfortable with but just try and see if you can follow this. There is the mind, there is the physical body and when you look within yourself you realize there is also awareness. Awareness is also something that is present there. The mind, the thinker, the thoughts looks at the awareness and says that also belongs to me. The body belongs to me, these thoughts that are happening belong to the thought and the awareness that's within me is also mine. And so when we look at spiritual masters what they say is there is a body, there is a mind, there is awareness but there is no owner of all these things. All these things don't belong to me, they actually belong to nature itself. They just appeared out of nowhere. I didn't create my body. I certainly don't create my thoughts. And I didn't create this awareness within me. If I'm not the creator of these things, then how can I believe that I am the owner of these things? And so this is the delusion. Once you start to understand that I am not me, there is a body, but it is not my body. There are thoughts, but it is not my thoughts. There is awareness, it is not my awareness. And there are possessions, and it is not my possessions. And so the mind never really thinks like this. The untrained mind is so convinced of its own realness. It's so believing in the idea that it is independent and it is free from everything else. And it believes in the importance of this creation so much that it never interrogates who created this. What is the real owner of these things? So the me spends its whole life looking to satisfy this body, looking to satisfy the mind. And the way it does it is just it goes out to the world and it consumes through the, the, the physical senses, through sight and sound and touch and smell. It, it convinces itself that if I'm the owner of this body, let's just do whatever is best for this body. And the spiritual masters have always said that you need to turn the light on. You need to realize that there isn't a snake in the room. There is only a rope. You need to realize that there isn't a me, an owner of this body. There is just the body. There is no th owner of thoughts. There are just thoughts itself. And this becomes something that cannot be done as an intellectual exercise because anyone listening to this who is not trained in this wisdom, who is not practiced in this, will say, well, of course there's a me. I feel it. When I just sit with myself, of course, here I am. I am here. But all of these is the delusion of the untrained mind. Try not to think about this as some other religion that's trying to convince you of a fact. 
This is not an, a, a religion. This is human beings who have gone far deeper than you and I into the me and discovered time and time again, I cannot find a real me. This is the delusion of the ego. And they've come back over thousands and thousands of years. People have practiced this and said, yep, it's true. There is no me. It's a delusion. It's a fog. It's something that has been putting, pulling the wool over our eyes. And so the guru is the darkness to light. The guru is the one who switches the light on and says, if you go and look, you'll realize it's not really there. There is no snake in the room. It's just a rope. There is no me in here. There is just the oneness itself. Nature is the owner of this body. Nature is the owner of these thoughts. And this is so convincing to most people. The idea of the me is so convincing that the masters have said that it's as, it's as though you're trying to explain it to a drug addict. It's as though you're trying to explain it to someone who's intoxicated. They're so intoxicated by the idea of themselves. We're so drugged that we, we believe so deeply that we exist that it's, it's very difficult to penetrate someone who is lost in that delusion. And so this is the most powerful drug of the mind. And remember what we mean by a drug addiction. An addiction is something that you want to hold on to. You're just so in love with it, so attached to it, that you just constantly want to have that experience again and again. Somebody who is addicted to gambling, addicted to food, addicted to a drug, as soon as it wears off, the only thing they can think of is, is getting back to that experience. And so the mind is addicted to the idea of itself. And we're so deluded by this, we're so drunk with the idea that I exist, that it's very difficult to lift someone out of that mentality. And the Guru, in many different ways, tries to remind us and say, look, let's just think about this. As long as you are going to indulge in the characteristics of the me, the ultimate characteristic of the me is attachment to the body, attachment to the mind, attachment to your surroundings, to your family, to your possessions. As long as you're going to keep acting in this way and doing the things that perpetuate this habit, you're not going to be able to break out of this addiction. So the Guru is trying to show you a new way to break out of this addiction and saying the first thing that you need to do is you need to understand that your addictions are being caused by your attachments. As long as you engage in these attachments, you're going to engage in the addiction itself. And the Guru is saying you can't be addicted to the world and then want spiritual union. You can't have this love and attachment to the body, love and attachment to the physical world, and then try and transcend that. You can't do both. So you have to give one up. You can't keep taking the drug and saying, I want to be clear of the drug. I want to be free from my addiction. You can't, you can't do both. And this is why we begin to realize this is so difficult. We don't know how to do this. We might read about it and we might talk about it, but it becomes a really difficult thing to do. And the Guru uses a really beautiful analogy here in the next line. He says, Maya ta mohani tine ki ti jin paya. He says, you are under this influence of this drug and realize that you have been drugged. Sit back and understand for a moment you are addicted. And when you look at anyone who goes through the recovery process for addictions, if they're in rehab, one of the first things that they say is, in order for you to get over this addiction, you need to admit that you are an addict. And when you look at anyone who goes to Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, they'll stand up and say, hi, this is my name and I am an alcoholic. And so the Guru is using this same methodology and saying, let's address the idea that you are addicted. And that's the first step of being free from this addiction, being, a, being someone who's recovering from this. Maya Tamohani Tine Kiti. Guru is saying, 
you have been drugged by this oneness. The oneness has drugged you. And the drug is so morny, is so enchanting, it's so delightful, this world, this me, this idea that I am here and, and I need to do whatever I can to make my life great. It's so enchanting that it's so difficult to realize that this has been, this has been a drug that's been given to you. So let's understand, what do we mean by this, that we've been drugged? Since birth, you've been born into matter. The physical body is something that your spirit has been put into. Life exists within this body. And you've only ever experienced the world through the physical senses, through your sight, through your sound, through taste, through touch. You've been always engaging with the outside world. The mind only knows to look outside through the senses itself. So, of course, the mind only knows this drug. It's not like you've been free from this drug and all of a sudden this is something that's happened to you. It's as though you've been born into this drug and you have just been constantly intoxicated your whole life. So, where does this come from? How has this happened? When we reflect on this, we realize that this is actually a normal, natural occurrence for human beings. The natural occurrence is that as soon as you're born, you don't have an ego, but through your senses and through your engagement with the world, the sense of self begins to develop. And you'll see this very quickly in children. One of the things, if you're, if, if, if you're a parent or if you have small children in your life, you see how quickly the children develop this idea, mine, I want it. It's very important for me that I have it. And they'll, they might even, you might see little toddlers who are cruel to other children. And it's so worrying if you're aware of spirituality and spiritual wisdom to, to watch this happen in front of you with your own children. Wow, they are developing an ego right in front of my own eyes. And when you see this, you really begin to be humbled by how natural this process really is. The idea of just developing the sense of me, it's almost important to the human being that humans develop this ego, this sense of themselves. And if you think that it's natural, then one of the obvious questions that comes up is, well, if it's so natural, why don't we just leave it alone? Why don't we just say, hey, this is hukum. This is the natural way of the world. Why don't we accept that as well? And the spiritual masters have said, yep, it's natural, it's there but you have an opportunity to not live with the consequences of this drug. You have an opportunity not to get so deep, deeply intoxicated that you end up with so much sadness, worries, depression, anxiety. You have a way of getting out of that. And so Guru's really speaking to you and saying, look, all this suffering that you're experiencing in life, it's because of this drug. Yes, the drug is natural and we can't explain why it's there, but we found a solution to this drug. We found a way to live without being addicted to this. So the mind has never really done this. On its own, the mind has never really comprehended who the owner of this body is. And it never really takes a step back and looks at the bigger picture. And this is where the help of the spiritual masters comes because the spiritual awakened one has gone and done that hard work of recovering, of overcoming from that, from that addiction. And they've gone and found their truest self and they say, I, I realize that I'm not the true owner of me, there is no me, and I can help you do that as well. So when we understand that this is a natural occurrence, we strip away this idea of blame. You know, sometimes when we, when we talk about spiritual matters and we talk about how the ego has occurred, it's so natural for us to even think, well, why did God do this to me? And we need to understand that, that there isn't some God sitting in the clouds that's done this to you. This is a natural occurrence. And let's not ponder so much as to why it's happened, but more about how do we get out of it? How do we improve our life? And the way that we can do that is when you start to hear this wisdom, the question that naturally arises what would my life be like if I lived free from this drug? Think about life as though it's a dream. 
You know, when you're dreaming, I know I'm one of those people that is never aware that they're dreaming. Every story that's happening in the dream, I believe it's absolutely real at that time. I'm always so envious of people who say that when they're dreaming, they know they're dreaming. And, but imagine that life is like a dream. What would your life be like if you knew that you were in a dream? If you woke up every morning knowing that this is fiction, I'm in a story and the story isn't real, it's just a game. It's just a play. What would your life be like? And when you start to ponder that question, you start to think, what changes do I need to make? I don't need to do anything physically different. It's a mindset, a mentality. How do I play this game knowing that I'm in a game? Knowing that I can always enjoy the game for what it is. I can't escape the game, but I can know it. And once, as soon as you see it as a game, you tend to play it in a different way. You play the game knowing that you don't have to get so involved with the emotion of winning and losing. You're just here to have fun. You start to enjoy it. When you know that life is a game, the ups and the downs of life don't become so traumatic. You don't get so involved with the emotions of, of the story of life itself. The next line, Guruji says, Kurban kita tise vitaho jin moho mita laya. Guru says something so interesting here. I sacrificed myself to that who made attachment so sweet. So the mindset has now completely changed. And Guru is saying, surrender your life not to Maya, but to the creator of Maya. Surrender not to the game, but to the idea of the game. To the knowledge, to the wisdom, this is a game. And to just sit back and say, wow, look at the creator of this game for a moment and say, well done. I see it. I see the game that we're, we're, we're being played. I understand it now. And surrender, make that shift within your mind. So we've spent our whole life completely at the mercy of this body, to this mind, to the physical world. We've become completely absorbed in it all. And we've surrendered our life to this. And the Guru is saying, nope, take a step back and surrender to the creator of this game. Stay, take a step back and realize there is a oneness here behind it all. And you're also that oneness. So surrender not to the physical world, but to the spirit of life itself. It's like, why would you attach yourself to the cake when you can befriend the baker? When you know the one who makes the cakes, then you become friends with that guy. And in the same way, the Guru is saying, don't get so lost in the drug, but actually enjoy the fact that, that, that this has happened and enjoy the flavor of it now. There's a different way of enjoying it. And it's a really interesting word here, this word Tagoli, this idea that you've been drugged, because we have so many negative connotations. We would think, hey, wh why would I want to be friends with the guy who drugged me? Why would I, if Maya is such a drug, then why would I make friends with the one who drugged us? And as soon as we do this, we fall into this trap of duality because straight away we fall into this idea that I'm the victim and somebody has done something to me. Somebody's oppressing me in some way. So we're lost again into the trap of dualistic thinking and wherever duality exists, and, and, and it's really important to understand what is duality? Duality is this idea of opposites, of two, not one. It's the opposite of one. So wherever there are opposites being made, wherever there is good and bad, old and young, friend and enemy, me and something else, then you fall into the, tra the trap of duality. So when we say this, this, this question of why would I be friends with this oneness who's drugged me, you've forgotten that oneness hasn't drugged you. Life is playing a game of hide and seek with itself. Life is the seeker and life is the one that's hiding. Your delusion is life saying, I'm going to play a game. And the game is, I am this oneness, but I'm going to create a part of myself that doesn't know me. I'm going to create a part of myself that has forgotten me. So the oneness is the all-knowing. 
the spirit of life that creates everything, but the oneness is also you, the one who's forgotten the oneness. So remember, it's a game that life is playing with itself. It's not doing it to you. And Guruji ends by saying, Kahe Nanak man chanchal chaturai ke paya. Says Nanak, fickle mind, none have obtained through mind games. And now this is Guruji repeating this lesson for the third time. Look how lovingly the Guru is saying, Hey, foolish mind, don't you get it? You can't do it this way. You are not going to solve this problem. You're not going to be able to fix your own drug by keeping engaged within this drug. So the Guru is showing so much love to you in so many different ways, explaining to the mind and saying, look, please awaken. You need to understand. You need to know that there is something greater going on here. But the Guru explains it so many times to us, knowing full well that your awakening is not your role. Your awakening is only going to happen through grace. And this is the great conundrum of this idea of discussing spiritual wisdom knowing full well that we can't get out of it we need the help of oneness itself to take oneness out of it answer these questions either by yourself or by discussing them with others in one of our meetup groups what is your understanding of maya how can you become more conscious of your thoughts how can we know that our perceptions have started to change do you feel that you're able to surrender your mind and sense of self?